Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today will be Gabe DeArmond of PowerMizzou.com. Gabe is one of the brighter people I know in the sports journalism industry, and we will have an interesting conversation about the future of sports in this coronavirus environment and specifically what will happen with football and with some television issues. We thank our co-sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host, an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. We thank our co-presenting sponsor, the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Today's news brought to you by Sutherland and Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland and Belk is committed to fighting for those who've been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. Well, some sad news. Former Vanderbilt football coach Woody Woodenhofer has died. Woody Woodenhofer coached, of course, around the turn of the millennium. And the best watermark at Vanderbilt was a 5-6 and six season where the Commodores nearly got to bowl but couldn't quite get over the hump. Anyway, our condolences to the Woodenhofer family. Our guest line is presented by Bowlin Branch, started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I had no clue how comfortable Bowlin Branch sheets were until I got them. They are fair trade certified, meaning they are made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress. That was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to BowlinBranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code Vandy and get $50 off your first set of sheets. One final thing before we go to Gabe. I had pre-recorded this. I forgot to plug in my microphone as I did the interview with Gabe. So apologies for the sound quality. You will hear much better quality on our next podcast. Gabe Yarman joins us now from PowerMizzou.com. He is a good buddy of mine. Gabe, thank you for joining us on what is a crazy day in Columbia, Missouri. Tell us what the scene's like there. Yeah, we got the uh, we got the shelter in place order, uh, which will start at ten o'clock Wednesday morning. So, even though we knew this was coming, I mean, St. Louis did it Monday, Kansas City did it Tuesday. I, I haven't really left my house for anything other than the grocery store in about a week anyway. Uh, pick up food at, uh, at a local restaurant a couple times just to kind of try to support some of the local businesses. But other than getting food, I haven't been out of my house in in a week other than maybe to exercise. So, you know, we know it was coming, but then the day it comes is a little bit crazy. I've, uh, I've gone to a couple of stores just trying to get some last minute things for my family and, you know, told my son, Anything you want from the grocery store, just pretend we're not leaving the house for a month. So, like, if you don't tell me about it now and you don't get it, you can't whine to me in three days because, well, technically I can probably go to the grocery store in three days. Uh, I'm trying not to go every day at this point in time. Yeah, we did an online order at Kroger yesterday. We picked it up. We'd ordered it four days before that. We ordered about $150 worth of food. We actually got $50 worth, and that was at the four-day lead time. You'd think we'd go to the top because of the list, but we did Because they were out of everything else? Yeah, I mean, and we even said, hey, substitute for this or that if you've got it, and even under those conditions, they didn't have it. Yeah, I mean, Chris, I went to Sam's Club, which has, like, more stuff than you could ever buy, right? I, I mean, just mass quantities, of, like gallon jugs of salad dressing. They have no fresh chicken except for wings at Sam's Club. It's uh, I, I've never seen anything quite like this. Meat is in scarce commodity. I don't know if it's as scarce as toilet paper, but uh, yeah, we have cold cuts, and that's been about it. Sausage, we got well, sausage if, last week, that, so that's if that's you been can't it. Buy any? Yeah, if you can't buy any meat, you might not need nearly as much toilet paper. <laughs> you have a good point. There so, could be a correlation you know, there. Hopefully all the same people have the meat and the toilet paper. <laughs> That's a good way to think of it. This whole thing has just been bizarre. How strange has it been for you to watch this from start to finish? I think the start was when you were watching the SEC tournament from home. 
you had Mitchell Forty covering in Nashville for you. I did not see Mitchell, but I was in the building that night covering Vandy. And it just sped up. It had so much momentum there. In other words, we're sitting there on a Wednesday, and it went from, hey, they're playing everything, and the fans are coming from, we're playing but no fans, to the next morning, nobody's playing at all. What has that been like for you just to watch this whole thing unfold in all sports? Yeah, I saw the, the only business this has been good for is people that make memes online. Um, the best one I saw this morning said, I've lived in, I've now lived in six decades, the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s, 2020s, and March. Um, yes. And that's what, that's what it seems like. I mean, it is beyond my comprehension, Chris, that it was two weeks ago that everybody thought they were playing the SEC basketball tournament. And, Every day kind of runs together. I mean, I don't really know what day is what day, but do you remember if it was Tuesday or Wednesday night of that week that Rudy Gobert tested positive? Well, it, I don't think it was Tuesday. I could be wrong. I think, I want to say that all went down during the SEC tournament or right after, but I, yeah. I'm like you, it does start to run together. Yeah, I think I saw that tweet actually during the Arkansas game. I can't even remember who they played anymore. They might have played Vanderbilt. But um, I, I think during that game, I saw the Rudy Gobert tweet. And that was kind of when you said, oh, no. Um, actually, for me, it, it kind of started, you know, everybody has their story about how this is affecting their own personal life. And none is any more important than the other. But about, I, I want to say about three or four hours before that, my son was set to have a swim meet in Columbia. Uh, Mizzou has like a world-class pool. We were going to have kids from about six states. It was like a championship swim meet. You know, it was a big deal. Um, It was supposed to start Thursday morning. Wednesday, Mizzou went to online classes and basically shut down everything. Said, you know, only essential personnel, no travel, all that. Um, So about 4.30 on Wednesday, we got the word that that, that his swim meet was not happening. And, you know, I mean, he and his teammates obviously were crushed because anybody who knows anything about swimming, like you basically gear up for about three weekends a year. Um, Like you have other meets, but it would be like a starting pitcher saying, we know you have 35 starts this year, but we really only need you to pitch well in four of them. So the other 31, you're going to go out there and you're not going to do that well. You're going to give up five runs and that's okay. But we need you this one night to throw a complete game shutout. And that was what that weekend was going to be for my son. And uh, he's a high school junior getting some, some attention and swimming and all that. So it was going to be a big weekend. And, and that got canceled and he was obviously devastated. And then the, over the next three days, it just became much easier to explain to him, like, look, this is happening to everybody. Um, this is, there are division one swimmers who can't swim at the NCAA championships up until now this morning there are Olympians who aren't going to be Olympians. Uh, You know, it it has, there is no one on the face of this planet who has not been impacted by this. And even, you know, like the last time life ground to a halt like this for us was after September 11th. But the the only difference is that was just us. I mean, that was American. Like it had an impact probably in other countries, but life kind of went on as normal. There is nowhere on the globe that life is going on as normal today. No, there's not. And I'm not a doctor or scientist. For some reason, a lot of our colleagues in the sports media like to play like they are or politicians, right. which has kind of been my thing I've always avoided. I like to stick to the parts I know, and I might have an opinion once in a blue about something else. But Um, I'm not an authority on it. I don't speak like one, but so I guess with that, we're all just guessing, but any sense of when we have sports again, you know, not a clue. I think, and and again, I think a big reason the Olympics were already postponed is, I I mean, those people have to be able to train, you know? And, and so you can't say, well, you're not going to be able to train till, till mid-June, but then in mid-July come out and have the biggest competition in your life. That's not realistic. I think the hope is maybe around July 1st, the NBA and the NHL could do some sort of, 
you know, last few days of the regular season and start the playoffs. And, uh, you know, what I, I was talking with some friends, I think what would be really cool and understanding in all this, we know sports don't really matter. We know it's not the biggest story it, when, you know, the Clippers and the Lakers can play in the Western Conference Finals. We all get that. Nobody's saying it's more important than anything else. But it is a big deal. Um, so I, I think it would be really cool if Major League Baseball could somehow open on the 4th of July. And, you know, you play six games at, at noon and four games at three and four games at six and nobody's at work. And it's just this, hey, life's coming back day. You know, uh, but I think that's the optimistic timeline. I, I mean, uh, you know, all along, Chris, you've been getting, I'm sure, the same questions I have for the last three weeks. What's going to happen to spring football? No, spring football is not what we need to worry about. We need to worry about if we're playing football in September. As, as far, again, as far as sports go, does anybody really care? No, but it is a big deal to, to a lot of us. I was on vacation last week, and I made the conscious decision to disconnect for about eight days. I did check Twitter and get some text messages and things like that, but I've not been as engaged. But what I'm hearing is I'm getting back dialed in on the Vanderbilt end of things is that there's been a lot of talk among ADs about football and the state of that. What kinds of things are you hearing? Well, I know that the ADs were having, you know, a daily conference call. I would assume they still are. I don't know. I know that was going on still as of late last week. Um, and look, publicly, I think Greg Sankey did the right thing by saying, I'm optimistic. We're going to assume football season is happening. Privately, I am sure every one of these places is planning, what do we do if we don't? Because, you know, all the talk about um, it, giving kids another year of eligibility and how are you going to afford all this and all that. As long as football happens, these athletic departments can find a way to finance that stuff. But if it doesn't, I mean, I don't know how they finance anything. And we're not just talking about, we're not talking about football. So, you know, uh, I've got a friend whose daughter is a senior in high school. She's not sure yet where she's going to college. She wanted to make two or three more visits this month. Well, that's not going to happen. She's just going to have to decide, <laughs> you know, sight unseen. Hey, this is where I want to go. What about somebody whose parents are going to lose jobs or have lost jobs because of this, who is a junior or senior in high school? And all along the plan is I I'm going to Vanderbilt. Mom and dad don't have jobs now. Mom and dad can't afford Vanderbilt. Um, that kid's not going to Vanderbilt. They're going to be school enrollment's going to be down everywhere. Money is going to be down everywhere. If you don't sell season football tickets, and Chris, I don't know about you, I wouldn't buy a season football ticket right now. I would wait until I 100% know they're playing. And then I'm not sure I'd buy season tickets then. I'd probably buy tickets to the first game and then say, let's see if we get to the second game. And then I'll buy tickets then. I understand some of these places you won't be able to do that. Alabama, you better buy them. You know, but places where you can, I'm not buying season tickets. The revenue loss is going to be, and again, college athletic departments aren't the most important place that's going to lose money, but they are going to lose a lot of money. Man, you bring up some great points I've not thought of. I'm with you. I think the people that buy season tickets are the ones that have a lot of disposable income and will do it to support the program. Yeah. But yeah, let's think about that for a minute. And my beat is, man, Take everything you're talking about for every other school and multiply it by 10 at Vanderbilt. I'm just thinking through this. If you have no football revenue, I know that will affect things everywhere, but what do you do with all the TV contracts and that money? Because right. I, I think you have deals signed, but you also have no product either. So how does that resolve? Right. like It's kind of fun right now to watch 1992 Kentucky on Saturday afternoon, right? Um, come September... I don't want to watch Alabama, Florida from 1993 instead of actually watching Alabama, Florida. I will have had my fill of old games by then. Um, the SEC network has to have something to put on or they can't give every school $41 million. People, because you want to know what one of the first things people are going to start dropping if football doesn't happen? 
well, why would I pay for this channel? I only have it to watch football. I don't need the SEC network anymore. And frankly, that's, that's when you and me start worrying about our job. You know, I, I, I want football because I love football, but I want football for selfish reasons. Because if I don't have football, I don't know how many people pay for what I do every day. Um, and, and then, and again, there are people who have jobs that are far more important than ours who are losing them now or have already lost them. Uh, our kind of oh no moment is probably four months away, uh, but it's not out of the question. Yeah, I want to ask how this has affected your business and your community. Mine, what's been amazing is that I have not lost. In fact, I've maybe gained a few, which is surprising. I think people do it to support the effort. And, of course, mine is different. There aren't just that many people that cover Vanderbilt. I run the basically the longest paid site around. And Vandy Mania is sort of an independent competitor, but most of what they do is free and um, message boards and things like that. So... I've found that I've sort of benefited a little bit just by the fact that I think people want us to keep our doors open uh, in a metaphorical sense. But what's it been like for you on the Missouri beat where there's a lot more competition and, and it's a different thing altogether? Yeah. I mean, we haven't taken a hit yet um, because first of all, to be honest, you know, baseball is not a big deal here. So this is the slow time of year for us anyway. Uh, Missouri's basketball season was over, except for, you know, a loss in Nashville. Uh, they, they were going to play two more games, maybe. So, you know, we were entering the, the period of time where it was going to be a little bit slow anyway. And there are two things that, that we have in this. First of all, the first three to four weeks, there's a lot of stuff to be written. I mean, Mitchell Forty has a story on our site this morning. He talked to a couple of wrestlers, a couple of swimmers, and Missouri's only basketball senior about what's it like to have your career in this way. You know, you can cover that. Um, you can. We're trying to get some of these assistant coaches on the phone and, uh, you know, get some kind of more deep, in-depth stories about them and, hey, what are you doing now? Um, you can write about how this is affecting, you know, what what the, the fallout of all this is. So that carries you for a few weeks. Um, and then, but come mid-June, if SEC Media Days isn't going to happen, that's when you start to go, yeah, I don't, like, what do you write about? I, I don't know how much longer we can continue to look back at, you know, Missouri, Kansas, 2012. But the one thing we have, and look, we all know this, even if we don't like to admit it, what really keeps our sites alive is the message board. I mean, our message boards are probably busier than they were. They're certainly busier than they would be this time of year any other year, because this is where people come to talk about things not just about Missouri sports, but about everything. So they're coming here to talk about this. I mean, we have multiple 15, 20-page threads about uh, all this stuff. Um, And again, like, there are people that will never, even if there aren't sports to cover, like, this is their community. They pay $9 a month to talk to people they've gotten to know and and their friends and, in some sense, kind of a, a loose second or third family. So that's okay, um, but eventually there has to be sports or you're not paying for a website that covers sports. Yeah, we also haven't raised our prices in 20 years either, which probably helps right now. It, it does help right now, no question. I mean, 995 is, you know, people can still find that. But again, I, I mean, this is going to hit everybody financially. And, uh, like, they're going to have to find things to cut, you know. And so it's a – look, I, I don't – I, I feel like I have to say it every 10 seconds. I, I get it, man. I, my job is it's non-essential. It's not a big deal, but it is my job. And it is how my kids are going to college. So I'm definitely going to think about it. I want to throw, boy, this opens up so many cans of worms too. Yeah. I'm thinking about like, is there a possibility of a partial football season? But then I back off that, okay? Like, let's say they decide to start October the 1st for some reason, then all of a sudden you have to deal with conference games and you try to reschedule those in December, maybe push back the championship. But that also implies you've got kids on campus and all sorts of things. I'm just trying to think, like, is there any possibility of a partial season or is it a shortened season or is it just all or nothing? Yeah, you know, one of the things I thought about is could you start 
October 1st and only play league games. But, like, the SEC plays league games in week one. So how does that work? And I don't know the schedule this year, but let's say Vanderbilt and Missouri were supposed to play in week two. I know they're not. But is there a weekend after October 1st where they're both not playing where they, you could then play that game? I, I don't know. Um, it is certainly a logistical nightmare, and, and everybody hopes it doesn't come to that. I mean, I would love the NBA to come out in a month and say, the worst is past. Fans can't come, but we're starting June 1st. You know, um, that'd be great. Uh, you know, because I think the NBA is, you know, who have been the trendsetters here is the NBA and the Ivy League. And I did find it a little bit amusing how much crap the Ivy League took because they were the first college conference to cancel things. And, like, breaking news, Chris, the people in the Ivy League are pretty smart. <laughs> Maybe they knew what they were doing. Yeah, it, Vanderbilt actually was ahead of the curve. I'm sitting there at the tournament, and I'm getting a text from a faculty member at Vandy saying, we're canceling classes for the rest of the semester. And, and of course, we're still all trying to process things. And at that time, it seemed maybe a little extreme. And all of a sudden, two days later, it didn't. Yeah, I was texting with Mitchell all day on Wednesday and, and Thursday morning just saying, how has this not been canceled? There's no way they're playing this tournament. And finally, about 1045 on, on Thursday morning, they came out and said, yeah, we're not playing this tournament. I'm also thinking, let's say this goes in the reverse and it goes better and school starts on time. There's been some talk of putting some spring sports into the fall. I mean, this is mostly coming out of baseball where you have a couple of coaches who yeah. have proposed playing a fall season. Of course, you have the own set of issues with pitchers' hells and training and those things. It's the same thing okay. Major League Baseball is going to face. That seems like a pipe dream, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, again, and I said it kind of jokingly, but I can see a world where, you know, all of a sudden on one Saturday in September, you've got the Indy 500, the Kentucky Derby, the Masters, uh, the NBA playoffs, Major League Baseball, college football, and the NFL all playing, and everybody goes, hey, let's do this every year. This is incredible. You know, we just have all this stuff. Um, obviously, that, that won't happen. I I don't know, spring sports, man, maybe, but again, it's, it's a scheduling thing. Um, and you have to remember when we're talking about this, we're not just talking about the SEC and the Big Ten and the ACC that can charter all their teams all over the country. We're talking about these small schools that have to bus places and that like they, they kind of scrape by, by the skin of their teeth to finance a lot of this stuff anyway. Can they do football and baseball at the same time? And especially if fans aren't allowed. I mean, and baseball, like you can't play a home baseball game on Saturday when you have a home football game. Nobody's going to go. You know, you're, not, you're losing money by doing it. Uh, so, um, I, I mean, you feel bad for the kids in spring sports, but I think you just have to say the year got lost. Yeah, and back to football for fall, if you say you just play a conference season, you still have some things that are out there that people are going to miss. Like you're going to have Louisville and Kentucky canceled. You have Clemson and South Carolina canceled. And, so, And you're going to have the SEC playing eight games and the Big Ten playing nine. And the Big oh, Ten yeah. Said, oh, our team deserves to be in the playoffs because they played one last game. I mean, it's going to be – if it doesn't happen, I don't know how you play half a football season. I think you might be able to get away with canceling the obligatory um, FBS game, maybe, although those schools really get hurt in that scenario. But yeah, I think, kills, yeah, I mean. It kills East Tennessee or whatever. Yeah, I think a partial schedule, the more I think about it, is impractical. Yeah, maybe not impossible. Like, look, if there's a way to do it, if, if it comes down to we can't play 12, but we can play eight, they're going to do it. They'll figure it out. It will be, I, I mean, the national title will mean almost nothing, I think, because it will be an eight-game season against, you know, imbalance schedule, all that. I mean, you think there's chaos now about who gets in. Imagine what happens if you've got, you know, seven and one versus eight and oh, and it, it'll be a mess. But if they can play games, they're going to play games. 
Thinking back to one other thing you said about like the Super Weekend with all those sports being covered, and it is it's kind of funny to think about it. Be man, that would be a day we'd never forget. But I'm also thinking from a TV perspective, you're gonna have some advertisers yeah. that are pretty upset because like all of a sudden you put all this money into X and all of a sudden X is usually the biggest thing going on yeah. at that time. But now you're running into competition from other sporting events too. So that's another issue. Right. You've got the masters push to CBS sports network. <laughs> yeah. You know, now, now that I don't think will happen, but yeah, I mean, you come up with, I mean, look, we could sit here. The thing about this game, I think we could outline a million scenarios and, and never hit it exactly the way it's going to play out. Well, and here's the thing to me, Chris, and, and I said this when they were talking about the eligibility stuff, like there's no answer that's good for everybody. There's no way in all this you can come to a solution that's good for everyone if it gets to the point where you have to rearrange things. Like they're just, they're, you know, if you're giving spring sport athletes another year, you're, you're screwing high school kids out of scholarships probably. Well, you know, no answer pleases everybody. And, and I guess when his wish comes out and we get online and 50% of the people are just furious about it, it's like, you got to cut people some slack. Like, whatever the NCAA does, man, I'd hate to be in the NCAA shoes and have to make these calls because somebody's getting hurt. It, it, it just There's no way to do it without somebody getting hurt. And so it, it, it'll be real irritating to me when I see a bunch of outrage. I can't believe they did this and screwed over my team or my kid or whatever. Like somebody's getting screwed in this. There, there's no way to not. I've got a couple more questions for you, including a couple from listeners, uh, because I, I said we try to do this in around 30 minutes. We'll probably go a little bit over, but I want to stay pretty true to that. Uh, but before we get there, I know that you have – you're a bright guy. You've thought through a lot of things. You brought up a lot of things in this podcast that had not occurred to me yet. And once you start on one thing, it just keeps going and going and going. But mm-hmm. give me another thing or two that maybe we haven't discussed that you think is worth talking about. Well, um, I, I mean, I think this whole eligibility thing, I guess they're going to gonna vote on the spring sport athletes in, on Monday. And again, whatever they decide, they there are issues with it, but hey, whatever they decide, everybody needs to go with. That's cool. The winter sport athletes, to me, I, I mean, I'm sorry. Like, there's a there's a wrestler in Missouri that Mitchell talked to this morning. He was in his sixth year because he'd been injured in three of his first five seasons. So he got another year. He got a medical redshirt. He had never qualified for the NCAA championships. And he qualified in his sixth year, and he didn't get to wrestle. Um, and now, if they allow it, he's going to apply for a seventh year. And, like, I hate it for that kid. That's, that's got to be crushing. He'll never get over it. But he got to compete in 95% of his season. You can't start giving winter sports another year. Because, again, it trickles down. So, take basketball. You give the basketball players another year. Well, everybody's already got recruits signed. So, so, scholarship limits have to go away next year. But then the following year, you're already at the scholarship limit before you've signed anybody. So what are you going to do? Tell a high school senior who are actually juniors now, sorry, man, no scholarships this year. I know you were going to play Division One basketball and go to school for free, but there's just no scholarship. I mean, it has to be like a five-year process of getting back down to 13 scholarships. And I just – I don't know how you do that. Um, that's, that's, I think, one of the big arguments right now is, is what they'll do with winter sports. And, and it's terrible. I would hate to be one of those kids. You know, Pat Forty wrote a great story. His son, his other son swims at Georgia, and he didn't get to swim NCAA championships his senior year. And it, it's crushing. And he'll never forget it. But, I, you know, do you fix it for him and, and then down the line somebody else doesn't get to swim there because of it? I, I don't know how that's any more fair. Yeah, I mean, it just sucks all the way around. And the kids that I really feel sorry for, because I remember some of the better times in my life were the last few weeks of college and high school when you're saying your goodbyes and doing your things the last. And then you throw in the layer of championships and things like that. That's what those are the kids that I really feel badly for. Yeah, and they're, they're, 
here in Columbia, in the next few days, I expect that they are going to cancel graduation ceremonies for the three local high schools. Um, look, like, I never really had any doubt I was going to graduate from high school, but it was still kind of a cool deal when you got to walk across the stage, right? And for some kids, that is a big deal, man. Maybe they're the first one that was ever going, or maybe you got a kid who's the first kid ever to graduate from college in their family. And now, like, my son is supposed to graduate from college on May 23rd. And if they don't have a ceremony, hey, that's okay. You know, I get it, whatever. I, I just hope we can drive up and take him to dinner, dinner, you know, and we don't know if we'll even be able to do that at this point. Um, so there's just, this affects everybody somehow. I, I wrote a column a couple weeks ago, like, We've all lost something, and it's important to remember what you've lost isn't any more or less important or any more or less damaging than what anybody else has lost. Um, and, yeah, it's easy to feel sorry for yourself, but, dude, your neighbor probably lost something. Your friend lost something. Your boss lost something. Your employee lost something, you know. So it's just uh, you got to keep that in perspective. Um, one other thing I am thinking about. And this is a complete wild card. How do you think this affects the transfer market? Because this is the time of year where that really starts to explode as basketball's ending. And I really wonder, every kid's different. Do we see any differences in how that all pans out, especially in hoops, you think? Well, maybe. Missouri just had a kid enter the portal on uh, on Saturday. Um, here's the dirty little secret about transfers, Chris. Isn't it weird how kids announce that they're going to transfer and like we already know the list of schools they're looking at and three days later they're somehow enrolled at a new place? I, I mean, yeah. you're Funny. not supposed to tamper, but everybody, nobody leaves a Power 5 school without knowing where, without having a pretty good idea where they're going. And so I'm not sure it's changed that much now. The one thing you can't do is say, hey, I'm transferring. I got five schools. I'm going to go visit all five. No, you're going to visit zero. You can you can FaceTime with a coach. Uh, you can do the virtual tour on their website, but you're not going to see it. Um, you're not going to meet the kids on the team, you know. So maybe it has an effect, but but I don't think it's huge. Uh, I, I think it's probably mitigated by the fact that most people expect that one-time transfer exception to go through. So I think kids that are thinking about transferring are going. Hey man, no way the NCAA is going to hose us on this now. I'm going to transfer because I'm going to be able to play next year. So you think the transfer thing, the one-time exemption, will be in place for the fall? Uh, I could see it not being because I could see the NCAA just saying we don't have time to do this. It's like we've got so much other stuff to deal with now that we can't deal with this right now. But also. Bodies like the NCAA are going to need wins in the court of public opinion. And you know what's a win? Hey, we're doing the, the right thing for the kids. I think that's why the spring sport athletes are all going to get approved for another year. Because whether it's the right thing or not, the public's going to think it's the right thing. And the NCAA is going to be able to say, see, we did the right thing. Um, and I, I think most public bodies make decisions based on what gets people the least mad at us. And I think if this thing gets pushed through and they say, hey, they can go anywhere they want next year, like coaches might be mad at them, but I don't really care. Coaches make $4 million a year. Uh, whether you're mad doesn't really bother me at all. Yeah, the exception to that would be Congress and the president. They're just collectively pissing everybody off right now. Well, but that's going to be true no matter what. <laughs> that's, that is true. That is, so we do have one American pastime left. We can all still sit around and gripe about politics. But um, one more question yeah, before that's I, a lot of fun. Yeah, that is. It's it's especially great when people do it on Twitter constantly. But um, Woody Woodenhofer passed away. Neither of us covered him, but what were your thoughts and what were the Missouri fans' thoughts as that broke yesterday? Yeah, you know, I, I never knew Woody. Um, he was, gosh, I want to say I was 11 when he got fired at Missouri. Uh, so that was like, I kind of became a college sports fan right around that time, but I didn't know a lot about him. Uh, we actually did a story. I tweeted it out yesterday. I had a guy do like, we just did a bunch of, where are they now stories a few years ago. And one of the guys he tracked out was actually Woody Woodenhofer, who at that time was working a toll booth on a bridge in Destin, Florida. And he said, actually he had more Vanderbilt people recognize him than anybody else. Um, Everything I've ever heard about Woody is he was a great guy. Uh, he was 
miserably unsuccessful at Missouri. It did not work. There are a lot of reasons for that. Um, mostly the chancellor at the time simply didn't care about athletics. I mean, Missouri uh, went without a bowl game from 1983 to 1997. So Woody was not the only guy that failed here. Uh, you know, they actually had a coaching staff at one point that had Andy Reid, Marty Morningway, Dirk Cutter, uh, and, and a lot of really successful coaches on it. And they couldn't succeed at Missouri because things were so bad there. Um, so that wasn't what he's full. I know a lot of people that, that played for him or that knew him and really liked him and, and had a lot of great things to say about him, but I, I never did. I'm going to quickly get into our mailbag, which is sponsored by Mark Jen of Simply a Fan. Mark organizes road trips to sporting events around the country uh, when those are going on. So when sports resumes, go to simplyafan.com, get more information, tell them you heard about it on our podcast. Uh, VandyFan96 says, could you talk about fundraising development of the process of Missouri's relatively new south end zone project? Could you give Vanderbilt fans, alums, and boosters advice on how to approach facility upgrades and what could Vanderbilt learn from Missouri? Yeah, well, that's going to get real hard now. Um, people are uh, going to have a little less money. Uh, um, you know, Missouri cost uh, Missouri, I, I don't know how Vandy works. Missouri, the athletic department is self-sufficient. They do not take money from the university. In fact, they pay money to the university every year for things like facilities and scholarships and, and this and that. Some like 21% of their annual budget goes straight back to the University of Missouri. Um, so the goal was raise all that, you know, uh, privately. I believe they raised about half of it. Uh, they took the other half in effectively a loan from the university, which they're going to pay back over time, which took a hit when the NCAA banned them from the football postseason and they lost $8 million there. So that's going to take a little while that there's going to be another loan involved to cover that. Now, again, we don't know exactly what's going on with the, you know, with money going forward. So it might take Missouri quite some time to pay that back, but at Mizzou, the goal is raise all that privately. Um, you know, again, $200 million raising that privately is pretty difficult. Um, Missouri is not a place that, you know, they're, they're generally 11th or 12th or 13th in, in fundraising and donors and things like that in the SEC. And I know Vanderbilt doesn't report those numbers. So that's out of 13. Um, you know, I've, I've gone back and forth on how important facilities are. I've had coaches tell me you don't have to be first, but you can't be last. Um, I always equate it. One of my favorite books was Dan Patrick and Keith Olbermann's book on sports center way back when. And the one thing that stuck with me in that, they said, you don't have to be incredibly attractive to be on television, but you can't be ugly. In other words, the first person, the first thing a person thinks when they turn on the TV can't be, Oh my God, how did that guy get on TV? The first thing a kid thinks when he visits your school can't be, Oh my God, their facilities are a dump. Uh, you don't have to have a waterfall and a PlayStation in every locker necessarily, but they can't be trash either. Yeah, I like the way you said that. That's kind of my position too. I I know at Vanderbilt, one of the things that's gotten in the way of fundraising is that there's been this hands-off approach from the university. These are our guys and you can't ask them because we want to ask them for this. And that always gets in the way of things. I know that at some schools and, and maybe most of them, there's some territorial stuff that goes on like that. What's that like at Missouri? Yeah, I'll be honest, Chris. I, I just don't follow the academic side very much. Um, you know, I, I know people personally who donate to athletics and donate to the journalism school. Um, I know that, that a couple of Missouri's biggest athletics donors also donate money to the university. Uh, so I don't really know. Um, how that works. I don't know if the J school gets involved and says, no, don't take this guy. All his money comes to us. I, I, I'm really not sure. Honestly. Last question. I predict this will be your favorite. Utah Ozzy says, he's curious I about what I'm drinking during. <laughs> well, I could ask that if it's interesting, but um, he <laughs> wants to know, I think this might be more interesting. What do Missouri fans think of Conzo? Well, told you. <laughs> if, if you go back 12 months, it's a whole lot different than it is today. Um, look, I, I'll be very honest. I was uh, I was not popular when they hired Conzo Mark because I, I said when they started that coaching search, I said, 
Look, the goal isn't find somebody better than Kim Anderson. Legitimately, anybody who's ever coached Division One basketball would probably be better. I mean, he was the least successful coach in the history of this program. He was 27 and 68 in three years. Uh, being better than that can't be the goal. Like, so the goal is to get back to where this program used to be, not to just be better than it is right now. And, you know, uh, Congo came in. It's funny. We're doing this today. This, today's actually the three-year anniversary of Michael Porter Jr. committing to Missouri. And uh, obviously he was hugely celebrated. Had a top five recruiting class in his first year. Now, I have said a number of times, Michael and Dante Porter were going to come to Missouri for pretty much anyone that was not Kim Anderson. Conzo didn't do a lot of recruiting other than hiring dad and not being terrible, you know. Um, and so year one went pretty well. Uh, they got back to the NCAA tournament, but they went, they pushed all their chips in in year one, and I understood why they did it. When you get Michael Porter, you have to do that because you know you're only getting him for one year. He played three games. Uh, they never won a game he played more than two minutes in. They got as little – as they possibly could have gotten out of getting the number one player in America to a place where they don't usually get the number one player in America. And what it actually did is it's a year two. I mean, if, if you reverse this, I mean, Abraham had gone six and six in year one and, and then seven and five in year two, people would be happy. But because he won seven and five in year one, it set up these expectations. Well, Conzo made the, SEC, or the NCAA tournament in year one, and it kind of set up expectations that just were never realistic because the roster was gutted. And they took a step back in year two, and everybody knew it. Everybody in the program said privately, like, look, this is really year one. That first year, it was like this standalone thing. Um, but the problem for him is they weren't better this year than they were last year. They had. They were 15 and 17 last year. They're 15 and 16 this year. Their entire recruiting class consists of a seven foot four two star that had an offer from Jacksonville State that nobody'd ever heard of. That's their whole class right now. Um, people are people have a lot of people have jumped ship in the last 12 months. Um, Conzo Martin, I've said a number of times, is one of the best human beings I've ever met, and probably the best one I've ever covered. I would have zero hesitation sending my son to play basketball for Conzo Martin. But he's coached college basketball for 12 seasons, and he's made three NCAA tournaments, and he's won games in one of those. Um, you know, so next year's huge. Uh, they have to be a tournament team next year. I'm not sure they'll fire him if they're not. Uh, but the enthusiasm for the program is not really much higher than it was when Kim got fired right now. And if they don't make the tournament next year, it, it will be uh, nearly non-existent. What was the actual ratio of questions you got about Michael Porter Jr. to minutes he played at Missouri? Um, infinity to one. <laughs> I mean, it was, every, it was every day. Like, I got to the point that I had to apologize by saying, look, I have nothing against Michael. He seems to be a fine person. I just can't do this anymore. I can't talk about this every day. Um, you know, there was actually somebody who covered the team at the time who took a picture of the cushion he sat on on, his, on the bench during games and tweeted it out. It was dreadful. Um, you know, uh, he's doing well now, uh, you know, which is kind of 50 50 for Missouri fans. Like, uh, they're excited for him you know, all that, but there's also the half that go, of course, this is how it works. The, the one year in his life, Michael Porter wasn't one of the best basketball players on the planet was the year he was in Columbia. Uh, yeah, that sounds familiar on a Darius Garland level. And with that, yeah, Gabe, oh, 100%. Yeah, <laughs> fought that battle before. Hey, Gabe, thank you for joining us today and staying on longer than we planned. I knew this would be an interesting conversation. It was. Of course, you run PowerMizzou.com, which is our affiliate at the Missouri, uh, for Missouri, on the Rivals Network. You also have, I think, 35,000 Twitter followers, and you're an interesting guy that people should follow if they don't. Tell us a little bit about where to find you on social media and what's coming up at your site. Yeah, it's just my name, Gabe DeArmond, on Twitter, and I want to be uh, fully transparent. My Twitter account is about to turn into just a Tiger King fan account. I don't know if if you're familiar with that or who's watched it on Netflix, 
it is the craziest television show I've ever seen in my life. And we've only watched two episodes so far. Um, so I recommend that everybody spend some of their quarantine time watching that show. Uh, but yeah, poundazoo.com. And as far as what's coming up, I'm like everybody else doing this. Man. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, Tiger King blew up on Twitter last night. I'm working my way through Dirty Money first, which is really good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, Tiger King is, uh, I don't know, man, prepare yourself. It's like, if you woke up and decided, I'm going to write a story so crazy that nobody would believe it, except it actually apparently happened. So. Yeah, so, so I hear. Hey, Gabe, thanks for joining us today. All right, Chris. Have a good one, man. He's Gabe Yarm at PowerMizzou.com.